So good evening, everyone. We're just going to give a couple minutes for everybody to connect their audio. And we have a lot of people that want to stay incognito today. Um, maybe everybody's in their pajamas already. Um, I am so jealous of all of you in your jammas if you are. Um, but so thank you so much for joining us and spending your evening with us. Uh, this is our monthly meet the team um, or what we like to call things parents wish they knew before having a baby. So this is all the things that, um, you know, it's like, oh, I wish someone had told me that. Uh, so we have different things each month that we, um, that we kind of bring up and chat about. And, um, and our team members take turns uh, presenting, which is nice. And so um, we have a couple of things that we're going to talk about today. Um, So our topics for tonight are, we have a lot of sleep things, how to get sleep in pregnancy. I know that seems like an oxymoron, but I promise um, Petra will give you some great tips. Hospital protocols right now, which is also very important because things are different than they were before. So what to expect when going to the hospital and getting sleep after baby. So you're probably seeing a bit of a theme for tonight. <laughs> um, maybe uh, all of us are just feeling the, the weather and wanting to um, just hibernate, but uh, we're gonna also take some time to answer your questions. And then we are going to head into some breakout rooms so that you can get to know our team a little bit better. So jumping right in, I would love to introduce our amazing sleep consultant, Petra Noble. So Petra has some fun um, details that will come up on the screen in a moment. Uh, so born in the Netherlands, where everyone has the option of having a postpartum doula after birth, which I think should be here as well. I don't know why that's only in the, the Netherlands. And she's also a mom of two teen boys, which keep her very busy. I'm a mom of one teen boy and I am already busy. So I can't imagine how busy your life is, Petra. And favorite quote is, wherever you go, go with all your heart. I love that, that's lovely. So Petra, take it away and tell us how to get some sleep during pregnancy. Okay, thank you. Um... First of all, let's see, let's talk a little bit about uh, why sleep is changing, especially at the end of your pregnancy. At the beginning of your pregnancy, the different reasons. Let's talk about at the end of your pregnancy now. So it is changing because you are growing, your baby is growing, and when your baby is growing, you are your baby is probably pushing on some uh, some organs, uh, mostly your bladder. So that's the reason why you have to get up quite often and moving from one side to the other side is not always, always that, uh, that easy when you are a little bit bigger. So that's why it's, uh, you have often uh, wake ups at night. So the importance of sleep during your pre uh, third pregnancy, uh, sorry, third trimester is it can actually set the stage for your postpartum time. So keep that in mind. You might want to hear more about that a little bit later on in this, uh, this session. But if you have better sleep during your last weeks of your pregnancy, you are better rested, you have less stress, and that can all be really good prep for when you're going into labor. Also, when you have uh, learned a few strategies and techniques to relax and to fall asleep easily, you might actually be able to use that during early labor when you still have time to sleep a little bit here and there in between contractions after the first uh, excitement thrill is taken off that you are in labor. So now let's go see how we can get you a little bit more sleep. One of the few things that is really important is to work with everything that is natural, like your circadian rhythm and your melatonin release. 
if you are paying attention to that, you are already ahead of the game. So that means that when you get up in the morning, that's when you plan for outdoor activities, when it, when it is possible. Exposure to daylight in the morning time will help you to wake up. Sometimes people say, well, I'm not fully awake early in the morning. If you do go out in the morning and you do get some exposure to sunlight, it's really great. At the same time, you want to, by the end of the day, you don't want to be exposed to uh, bright lights, loud music, lots of interaction. Like we cannot go to the mall, but going to the mall would always be a trigger for me that uh, might keep me from sleeping. So keep those things in mind. Uh, using melatonin, the brain releases melatonin, which helps us to, uh, to fall asleep. So if you have figured out for yourself, like, okay, my ideal wake up time is at seven o'clock in the morning, and my ideal fall asleep time is around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, or maybe 10 o'clock, stay with that. Wake, wake up at seven o'clock in the morning, even on the weekends, like get yourself into a schedule. That also helps with your brain to recognize that, hey, it is time to wake up and hey, now we need to get ready for sleep. So those are simple things and natural helpers that, that are very useful. Uh, start an evening routine. And with that, we mean like, uh, stop <laughs> checking your phone. I know that's a really hard one for everyone. Turn off the screens. Uh, stop watching television uh, at least an hour or two hours before you go to bed and leave your cell phone out of the bedroom. Because if, when you do go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, it is very easy to pick up your phone and say, hey, let me go and check. Let's see if, uh, if my friends are already sleeping or if they did reply to whatever I asked uh, late last night. So it's very tempting, even if it is on vibrate or turned off, when we feel like we cannot fall asleep, we will go check our phone. So try to uh, try to turn that off early on. Uh, change the, the lights on your devices to the nighttime setting. And another thing that is really good to do is change the light bulbs in, uh, in, your, in your house, in your bedroom to red bulb, a red, a red light, because that doesn't interfere met, with the release of melatonin. So that's, these are all very easy things that you can do. And then after your baby is born and you don't have these bright lights going on, it will also help your baby to uh, sleep easier. So all really easy things to, uh, to work on. Uh, check your food intake. What, uh, what do you eat later in the evening at the end of the day? And what do you drink? Like avoid caffeine. Uh, avoiding chocolate is really hard. I, I would be having a really hard time doing that. So if you can, that's really good. Eat products that are high in vitamins and minerals that aid in promoting sleep, like dairy products, uh, turkey and chicken, nuts and seeds, bananas, avocados, or tart cherries. I'm not sure why they need to be tart. I would say any cherry, but if you find tart cherries, apparently they work better. And drink, think, drink uh, liquids that are also uh, promoting sleep, like uh, warm milk, uh, almond milk, passion fruit tea, and chamomile tea. These are also really good things. And use your bed really for sleeping. Make your bed as comfortable as possible for sleeping. Uh, use a pregnancy pillow, which is very comfortable, very helpful. And you can also use during your postpartum recovery time, because sometimes you need a little, still a little bit of support uh, after you've given birth to the baby when you are sleeping. Having that pillow can be very, very helpful. Uh, a dark room is always really good uh, because when it is dark, our, our, our eyes are automatically, automatically adjusting and they are like, okay, I cannot stay open. I cannot really see what's going on. I'm trying to give you guys a visual. I'm falling asleep myself. So if you can have a really dark room, that's really good. Uh, you can use an eye mask if, if needed, if, you, if your room is not dark enough. White noise, uh, getting used to that is, is very easy, very soothing. There are some really good white noise machines in the market. And uh, you can, uh, if you're not a big fan of it yourself, your baby will probably really like it uh, after, after being born. So that's a really 
uh, good investment. Temperature of your room is also really important. You want to sleep in a room that is cool and not too warm. If a room is very warm, it can be very hard to fall asleep and stay asleep. You really want the room to be between 19 and 21 degrees Celsius. That is between 69 and 71 Fahrenheit, I believe. So when you have really good sleep or when you have the technique to, to fall asleep during your uh, last weeks of pregnancy, it is a lot easier to continue that early on postpartum. And I realized that I forgot to say one thing that you can do also is uh, use some uh, meditation or soothing music before you fall asleep. That's always, always very helpful just to, to slow the brain down and to help you relax and fall asleep. And that was my little sleep talk. I hope you all have a really good night. Thank you so much, Petra. That was great. Um, I know that sleep is so difficult to get when you're pregnant for so many reasons. And I used to always joke that I thought it was nature trying to help us get ready for not sleeping when baby comes. <laughs> um, but uh, you have lots of tips for, for uh, all sorts of sleep, and we're going to find out more about that later too. So now I would like to introduce our Jessica Payne, who supported her first birth at 15, years before officially becoming trained. So, you know, family members knew that this was what she needed to be doing, that's for sure and had a COVID style wedding this past October. So they decided to stop waiting and uh, had a beautiful socially distant wedding in the backyard. And I know we're all waiting for when this is finished and we can all party together and celebrate. Um, but uh, it, was, it was beautiful to watch over Zoom, that's for sure. So Jessica, will you please tell us how to prepare for giving birth in a pandemic? Thank you, Christy. So hello, everybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit around kind of what to expect from beginning to end um, in terms of your healthcare providers and what we have in place currently during the pandemic. Um, in terms of those that are currently pregnant, you are probably already aware that there has been some changes for the amount of visits that you're having in person with your healthcare provider, whether it's an obstetrician, family doctor, or midwife we're all seeing fairly vast changes. So whether that may be um, limiting the amount of in-person, going to some video calls or phone check-ins, we see this as well for postpartum. So if you have any questions at the end, please feel free to ask how that might be adjustment for your own particular. But something to keep in mind in terms of these adjustments that we have, we wanna try to find the silver lining here with what you still can do what you can still get excited about because you're having a baby and this is a time of celebration. And just like I had a COVID style wedding, you can have a COVID style birth of your dreams. You really can. So some things that we're noticing because of restrictions is it is important to restrict the number of people that are in one room. So this might mean that your support person or a family member that maybe you would have liked to have joined you to some of these sessions, even ultrasounds, things like that, may just not be possible during this time. So something to ask for is talking about the option of FaceTiming with your family or friends that you wanna celebrate these milestones with, or taking photos or videos through your session to be able to share with your family members later. These also can really help to create a capsule of your experience that you can look back on, which is really exciting. Another thing that we notice regularly with our clients is because the quickness of visits Sometimes this lacks the amount of ability to have conversations with your healthcare provider with questions that they may not see as a medical urgency, but for you, this might be your first experience or maybe it's your second and things are a bit different. So it's nice to be able to use our group chat that we have for prenatal and postpartum clients that provides private support one-on-one -on -one with a doula to be able to ask questions in between visits or be able to help prepare that the visits you have with your health provider that you can really get the most out of that session. Or I'm sure some of you experience this where your doctor, your midwife says at the end, okay, and next time we're gonna do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's nice to be able to reach out to your doula to say, um, what should I expect at this blah, blah, blah meeting? 
to be able to help prepare yourself and be able to go into it feeling really empowered and really part of this experience. Another thing to know that, oh, sorry, something missed there. Protocols can change daily, and we have seen a huge change in protocols all across the GTA from March. That's when things really started to change in the GTA. So this can be really within 12 hours or less. If there's something going on globally, they may need to make different adjustments, and I'll talk about what that, what that looks like. It's also important to know that this is not across the board. So whether you're delivering at St. Mike's Hospital or Mount Sinai or Southlake, or you're giving birth at home, protocols can still be quite different from your place of birth. And it also can be quite different based on um, who your midwifery group is. They also have their own unique protocols, same with OB to OB. And recently, um, I noticed from personal experience with a client that protocols can even change based on who's on the shift. So sometimes there can be a little bit of flexibility with something that might be really important to you. So the takeaway message is it does not hurt to ask. And because things are changing quite regularly, it's important to even ask in early labor before you head there, calling in, talking to the triage, the charge nurse and asking any changes on X, Y, Z of the policy that you, you know of. Something also to keep in mind, if you're chatting with other people that are pregnant during this time and they share a story or an experience that they had, keep in mind, it's likely gonna be a little bit different from you unless you have the same healthcare provider, give birth on the same day, and are also giving birth at the same place. Personal protective equipment, I think we have all really gotten used to this throughout the pandemic. I think I'm totally desensitized. I almost sometimes forget I'm wearing a mask. Funny enough, I was trying to blow out a candle <laughs> a couple of months ago with a mask on and realized like a complete dummy that um, that's not gonna work so well. So the reason why I'm saying this is wearing a mask while you're in labor, you know, a year or two ago might seem unfathomable how that would happen but we are, all of us are wearing personal protective equipment to keep everybody safe. So what can you expect? Well, your healthcare provider, whoever they are, is going to be wearing a mask and shield at all times. So it's always important to slow down the conversation. If you don't fully understand what they say because you can't see their lips, feel free to let them know. They can repeat things and slow things down. That's really important. At the time of the actual birthday party, when baby's here, you can expect that they will be wearing additional measures, typically a gown, gloves, things like that. Nothing extra for yourself. Things for yourself as the birthing person and any support person you have with you that day is required to wear a mask anytime a health provider is in the room. So that means when they're not in the room, you can take it off to be comfortable. In situations where you're finding that it is really uncomfortable, maybe it's hard to focus or to breathe, you do have the right to advocate to ask to take it off intermittently. That is A-OK. -okay. Same if you need oxygen or anything like that, they do keep that in mind, that it's also really important that you're able to get good airflow. In and out privileges. So this is a big one that we notice is very different from the place of birth. And what this means is what can you anticipate from when you enter the hospital? Are you allowed to exit the hospital? And this really goes for your support people. So what we can see is a difference in, pardon me, I'm just making sure I've got my notes. Um, sometimes the hospital will allow for your support person to leave the room. So that would be, let's say, to go get a coffee at Tim's at the cafeteria. Some will allow them to go to the front door to go pick up things like Uber Eats or skip the dishes or a handmade casserole from grandma that's dropping it off. I'm just throwing out a random situation. I've never heard of that before. Um, or some are also letting the support person leave, take a shower, have a nap, and then come back. So these are all things to know potentially could change, but it's important to know to help you prepare. 
Um, it's also possible that your support person is not recommended to leave the room whatsoever and to be using the facilities that are in your private one-on-one -on -one room. So in terms of being prepared, you really want to pack a picnic. I cannot stress the importance of food. Food is what makes the world go round. I know the other ladies are talking about sleep today, but nourishment is my go-to thing. Um, it's important to know that while you're there as the birthing person, they will give you liquids. So things like broth, tea, water, jello, crackers, like very minute things. But it is recommended to be eating solid foods in a lot of situations. So having things like snacks for yourself, things that you enjoy that are going to bring you energy are important. Once you've had your baby, they do give more solid foods. Um, and it is based on what your preferences are. If you're vegetarian, if you're not vegetarian, I can't think of other preferences, gluten-free, allergies, things like that. But it is hospital food. So it's a good idea to bring things that you like so that it's easy to eat, especially when you're feeding baby. It's important to know they do not feed your support person. We kind of forget about this sometimes. And support people are super important. They are like our heroes in the throes of things and keeping you comfortable. So having food for them, real food, not just granola bars and fruit, we cannot really enjoy those type of items for a long term. So think of things you can heat up. The nurses are fantastic. They will go to the, um, you know, the refreshment room and help heat things up, but have things that you really, really enjoy. And if it happens to be that you don't eat at all, that's fine. You've got food made for postpartum, which is fantastic. So I like to recommend to our clients, plan to have three to four days worth of meals with you. Snacks for yourself and more solid food meals for your partner. And the last but not least, it is important to spend time at home as much as possible. So because there's so many restrictions at the hospital, we know that labor happens with oxytocin, which is that love hormone. When you're feeling good, um, that's when you know labor starts happening really well, you progress and you also stay more comfortable at home. So the hospital is really going to recommend, um, or your midwives, if you're going to the hospital with them, or when it's time for labor support at home, they really want you only to be going into the hospital when there's three situations. One, you're ready to have a baby, which means you're getting ready to meet your little one. You're an advanced labor. Two, you're ready for pain medication, like an epidural or maybe IV medication, whatever that may be. And three, in a situation where you might need to have medical intervention to keep labor moving, kind of like augmentation or an induction of labor. Otherwise, you wanna stay at home and get comfortable. So this can be a little bit challenging, especially when you're a first time parent to know, well, what am I supposed to do at home? <laughs> How am I supposed to stay comfortable? Who's supposed to reassure me with what's happening is normal? what's going to be happening next, and what are some strategies to stay calm. These are all things that doulas do, and doulas are not cancelled. Support is not cancelled. Virtual birth support is literally having a doula at your fingertips. You can reach out to them at a moment's notice through text, phone call, video call, to be able to help walk you through all of these unknowns. But the nice thing is, you get to take them along to the birthplace when you're ready. And those questions are then changed to helping you advocate for what's important, prompting the birth preferences that you had or early postpartum and helping to soundboard with whatever happens to be able to create a rolling plan. So I hope this was helpful. Um, you can make the most of having a baby during this time and they are really fairly minor situations that are adjusted. But the overall thing is we still celebrate our babies and we do that with getting some extra support. Thank you, Jessica. That was great. And I'm so glad that you brought up virtual birth support because I think a lot of people picture this tripod with a video of like a doula face in the corner. And they think like, that would be the weirdest thing <laughs> to have this like person. And, it, and that is not what the service is. It is really... Um, this 
expert in your back pocket, like you said, you know, a very personalized Google that can step in at any time um, and give that extra information and reassurance. So um, our clients are, are loving it and our doulas are, are actually really enjoying doing the, the support as well. It's, it's, it's nice because this never would have been something that we would have launched if it wasn't because of COVID, but because of it, we'll always have this great service. So grateful for that. So last but certainly not least, we have Sharon Clements. So Sharon was doulaing her family before she even knew what it was. And I know doulaing is not a word, but it is because we just need it. Um, so you know, she uh, yes, my last name is Clements, and her last name is Clements. So those of you who have put it together, I belong to her. Um, and she was doulaing um, her grandchildren and just helped me so much when I was a new mom and also um, family members as well. And she has two new furry grand piggies that have just been welcomed into the family. So my nine-year-old son has two guinea pigs that he got for his birthday. And so there are these two little guinea pig babies at our house um, that uh, everybody is enjoying. So Sharon is going to be talking to us about postpartum sleep. So take it away. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> yes, OK. So um, the main thing I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, in postpartum, most of the families that I deal with as a postpartum doula are absolutely shocked at how little sleep they get for the longest time. And it, it's just exhaustion. And so um, I want people to be prepared. And a lot of uh, our families say, like, I'm prepared for everything else. I was not prepared for being so exhausted and totally overwhelmed because I'm not getting rest. And like Petra says, it starts before your baby's born and making good, good situations and good habits um, are so important. Uh, but the sleep deprivation uh, starts before the baby's born. Uh, like Petra says, sometimes you're not sleeping good uh, for a couple of days or week even before the baby comes because you're, you're just uncomfortable in bed. Um, you're not finding a, a comfortable way to sleep. Um, during early labor, uh, you're going to be sleeping off and on, and that can take quite a while. Um, some people's early labor is, is a week. You know, early labor isn't always just a couple of an hour or two before. Um, you've got little twinges that'll wake you up. Um, like Petra says, you always have to use the washroom, and that still wakes me up, and I'm not pregnant. <laughs> Um, so, uh, before the baby comes, you're still going to be, um, starting to see that you're tired already. Um, also during the process of labor, um, you are expending so many calories. It's, uh, been told to me that during a normal labor, you use about the same amount of calories as a person who runs a marathon. So that is a lot of energy and you're going to need some some energy reserves to actually get through this. And it's, it's exhausting. It really is exhausting. Um, your hormones are gonna go crazy. This is the time when um, your hormones just, uh, you're so sleep deprived and your hormones are totally out of whack. So just, um, just be prepared for that. Like uh, Petra said, so many of um, the good sleep hormones that we have um, are being affected right now. Um, you also have to be prepared for once the baby's here and uh, you know your baby is going to need attention uh, for feedings, for changings, for whatever. Um, generally, the babies when they're newborns are going to be fed about every uh, two and a half to three hours max. And generally that can take us at least a half hour 45 minutes, half hour if you're a real pro at it, but probably closer to 45 minutes to an hour. And that doesn't end after a couple of days. That is going to go on for at least three to four weeks. Then once your baby is a little bit bigger, you will slowly be able to stretch out their feedings to maybe three to four hours. But three to four hours is the max for months 
for months. It's usually at least uh, three to six months. And um, the one thing I wanna tell you is that um, if, uh, if your baby is sleeping longer than that, that's not always a good sign. Sometimes babies uh, who are sleeping too much are not well. And when they're not well, they're not sleeping, if they're sleeping too much, they don't have energy to nurse properly, to eat properly. They're not getting their calories to grow, things that they need. And so it's really important to feed your baby on time, but it is extremely <laughs> exhausting. Um, once the baby is around, usually around between four and six months, your doctor, uh, you can talk to your doctor about possibly feeding on demand. And at that point, baby should be big enough um, that they're gonna tell you when they're hungry. You're gonna to have to learn their feeding cues, but you should be able to, at that point, safely uh, not have to set your clock. But up until that time, it really is important to follow your, your schedule to keep baby fed. Um, don't, uh, don't believe your sister-in-law or your best friend who said that their baby slept. Uh, oh, my baby was two weeks old and slept all night long. Um, that is more of a fallacy. And if they're telling you that, I think they're, they're forgetting a little bit. Don't listen to those things because it's really, it's not the norm. Don't expect that to be the norm. And I think if you have the right expectations, you're not gonna be surprised. Um, babies are also really noisy. I think this is what surprises people. They think babies go to sleep and it's quiet. They're usually not quiet. They are little squeakers and they, they squeak and they make noise and they, their tummies rumble and they let out little toots here and there. And like they, they are not quiet. And so the problem with this is if baby's in the same room as mom, mom doesn't always get the REM sleep she needs. And REM sleep is super important for everybody, for mom especially, because you really need um, to have that good deep sleep. So it is, if you have help, it's great to let baby sleep in another room with that person. And if you don't have help and you can have a monitor, let baby sleep in their own room. They're gonna be fine, you've got your monitor, but during that time you can adjust the, the volume so that some of the little squeaks aren't gonna keep you awake. There are some moms that just, every little squeak, they're alert and they're looking in the bassinet to see what it is and it's nothing. So. You really have to try and get some really good deep REM sleep. Uh, so I don't know, these are some things that can happen to you from lack of sleep. And I mean, we've all heard about the, uh, the torture sometimes that, uh, you know, in different uh, armies and stuff like that, sleep, sleep deprivation was a torture that they did to people. You know what, kids do it to us all the time, they're little torturers. Um, but the thing is that it can cause depression uh, memory loss. A lot of moms are accident prone. Um, you lose your libido. You're tired. That's the last thing. Your brain function is slower. Your cognitive reactions are slower. You can actually gain weight because you are so tired. You have no energy to do anything. It does speed up um, the aging process and you will look a lot, you know, maybe past your age. Um, high blood pressure can, can happen and it weakens your immune system. Like sleep is so, so, so important. And all these things are important to being healthy, to be with your baby. Um, if it's really severe, which some people do have really um, big problems after baby, you can actually have um, delusions, confusion, stress, emotional instability, paranoia. Um, you lose your common sense and you have a much higher rate of infections because you have no strength to fight anything off. So those are just some points to think about how important it is um, to get proper sleep. Um, so I just want you to know that hormones, like Petra mentions, some of the hormones are super important um, to get a good sleep. And at this point, we are all hormone hostages. Our hormones are going crazy. So your adrenaline during labor um, can uh, still stay in you for a few days after. So a lot of the moms are all, they're all high and all, oh, they're so excited and everything, but they, and they don't sleep because they're so happy and they're looking at their baby and they're so in love. So that can be caused by a lot of adrenaline during the birth. 
which you need to help you push your baby and, and get through labor. Um, your estrogen levels are low. Um, your whole body is now going to go into transition. You are start uh, making prolactin to get your milk supply going. Your progesterone levels are off. And uh, there is a hormone called uh, cortisol. And cortisol is a stress hormone and it's kind of a, a negative thing. And cortisol can actually slow down um, your metabolism. It can increase stress and inflammation. It can raise your blood sugar. Um, it, it whacks your melatonin out of, out of uh, control. And like uh, Petra said, we get our melatonin from our, our hypothalamus. So it's important for us to get the light at the right time. So try and get your light at the right time. And um, just reverberating what Petra said, it is so, so important to turn off the electronics. Totally turn off the electronics because that is one of the really um, detrimental things to your sleep. Um, it is really important for mom to sleep as much as possible for the first few weeks. And a, a lot of times mom's all excited. She's all high in life, loving her baby. Uh, she wants her friends to come over. Now that we have COVID, she's texting like crazy. She's FaceTiming everybody. We're all excited. But the problem is that you really need your sleep. Um, it, it aids in healing the mother's body. It increases your milk supply so that you're, if your baby's breastfeeding and it allows your hormones to come back to the pre-pregnancy levels. And the, it's been proven the moms who do take time uh, at the beginning of postpartum, um, they really are healing so much faster and they have so many less uh, issues later on after, after the few first months of postpartum. Sleep is really, really important to get yourself um, feeling well. Um, it also helps with baby's development. They need a lot of sleep to grow and develop and they need parents who can be attentive to, attentive to them um, when they need, when they need them. So moms who are sleepy, dads who are dragging it, you know, it's really important that we have parents who are, um, you know, ready to answer the call of our little one, but you have to sleep in between and just don't be tempted to, after COVID, you know, go to the mall and do all these crazy things and do housework and do the dishes and be super mom. You don't need to do that right now. You need to rest and recover. Um, suggestions for getting adequate sleep. Um, one of the big things is to ask your partner or family or friends or a professional like a doula to help you with things like your meals, your housework, um, to help with night feedings. And this is one thing that a lot of new moms have told me. They find the night feedings, if they're breastfeeding, very lonely. You know, when you're up at 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, and you're all alone and the house is all quiet and it's dark and it's just you and the baby, it does sometimes get very lonely. And if you're already tired, it just can put you into that negativity. And we don't want to pass that on to our baby. So having your partner get up with you for that little time, if, if possible, have them just sit and chat with you. Um, have, a, have a nice little snack waiting for yourself. Um, have a postpartum doula there to spend some time with you. And if you do choose to use a bottle, you know, nighttime feedings with a bottle with, with your uh, birth parent, or another family member, even just once, one in a while, once in a while, if you pump some milk or whatever, sometimes it really gives you a great break. And it's just night times are very lonely sometimes for people. So just to remember that. As Petra said, um, I think it's really important um, to have a nighttime routine and uh, start your activities an hour or two before uh, you go to bed. Um, for sure, the biggest one is limit screen time. Um, and stop all caffeine. Um, I have a few little tips that, that are helpful that are maybe 10 minutes each and you might find some of these helpful, you may not. Um, but try and go to sleep, like Petra said, at the same time every night. Get up at the same time, go to sleep at the same time. Um, read a book for pleasure. Reading a book is not screen time and it's not doing work and it's not answering texts. Just have a book that is 
something light and makes you feel good, a feel good book and read that for 10 minutes before bedtime. Um, keep a notepad beside your bed. Uh, this I think is one of the biggest ones because you'll be laying in bed and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I forgot to whatever, order diapers or call my sister-in-law or whatever. And you're gonna lay in bed and that's gonna bug you. <laughs> it's gonna bug you because you're gonna think you forget again. So if you've got that night, night uh, little pad, jot down something because then it's out of your mind and then you can rest. Um, it's really nice to have a relaxing bath or shower if you can before bed. You don't have to use it for getting clean. It's just for relaxing. Uh, aromatherapy oils and lotions are really great. That's a distressor. It's a little pampering and can make you feel good. Um, listening to calm or meditative music at this time is really, really good. Um, doing some light stretches or some yoga that also can tire you, tire your body a little bit while relaxing your mind. Um, dim lights or candles, super important. Petra gave you the, the tip about the, um, the, dim, the dim lights. And uh, she also mentioned, and, and I always bring this for my, for my moms, is um, offer a warm drink usually at nighttime. So a herbal tea, warm milk, um, whatever you enjoy but something warm is very relaxing. Um, and moms, you need to care for yourselves um, to be a good mother to your baby. Um, if, if mom's out of commission, <laughs> the whole family's <laughs> got a problem. You are the center of the universe. So take care of yourselves, eat lots of nutritious, healthy food. Um, take care of yourself, have, have a shower. Uh, personal care is so important to your well-being. Pamp, pamp yourself a little bit. Um, make visits really short if you do have people who drop in um, and indulge in pleasurable activities like today was such a perfect day to go out for some vitamin D it was just a, a really nice day to go for a walk on a sunny day I mean you can treat yourself to a, a little mani pedi if you've got somebody who watched the baby after COVID um, make telephone <laughs> make telephone chats short um, and make uh, in, and have inspiring chats with your friends and family. If they're going to call and just tell you boo hoo hoo, uh, it's time for you to say, "Oh, I hear the baby, and it's time to go." <laughs> okay, you don't need to hear this stuff. And uh, most of all, enjoy the love that you have with your baby. Um, let it flood your whole body with oxytocin. Oxytocin. When you stare at that baby. It's just so amazing that the love in your heart and how good that makes you feel. Um, and you know, so much of vitality depends on good quality sleep. So please, even if any of these little things are helpful um, to all the moms who are listening, please, please try and do it because sleep is so, so important. And if you can start ahead, like Petra says, um, during pregnancy and follow these habits through, It'll be better for everybody, including your baby. So there you go. That's all my tips. I hope everybody has a great birth and thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was really great. And, you know, I, when I was listening to you um, talk about a lot of those things, I think, you know, when I'm tired, the last thing I want to do is, go take a bath, even though I know I would enjoy it or um, go for a walk. I just want to like curl up on the couch and, you know, I'm tossing and turning in bed, but I don't want to turn the light on and read um, a book. And I think that's why we love what we do as doulas, because we can be that encouraging, assertive, sometimes uh, nudge for for parents to actually care for themselves. Like how many times have we gone to a shift where the partner is run ragged because they have just been doing so much. And we have to say like, I'm here, you can go take a nap or, you know, you can go 
to the store because then it's like it's just something to to get out um and so you know it's really really great to have the the job that we do and be able to to care for families um so thank you for all of those tips and and our expectant parents know that we understand how hard it is to do these things that sound so easy um but you know sometimes we we just need to hear it enough times that maybe we'll it'll it'll kick in at some point so um, we like to allow time for any questions that um, that you may have. It doesn't have to be based on what we talked about today. It can be really anything. Um, so we'll we'll give you a moment to see if you if you have any questions and if you don't want to unmute, you can send it in the chat um, and I can I can read it out. And if no one has any questions, um, we will be breaking out into breakout rooms. Uh, so not to be afraid, it's not, we're not scary, um, but it's nice to, it's nice to have a moment to, to talk to someone on our team, um, just to, to get to know us a little bit more, or ask more about our services um, and, uh, or anything else. Uh, we do have a question. Um, do we have to wake the baby every two hours if they don't wake up themselves? So that's a really good question. Uh, thank you for asking that. And this is something that can get very confusing after families leave the hospital when they tell you that you need to wake up the baby every two, two and a half, three hours. It depends on, on the healthcare provider or the nurse or whatever it is that they suggest. Um, and it is important to wake babies in the, the first little while because the, the first milk, which is colostrum, is like skim milk. It doesn't have a lot of calories um, and jaundice levels tend to go up in the first few days. And so babies can sometimes be sleepy because they just don't have the calories to wake up or they have um, jaundice that is making them extra sleepy. So uh, we have had clients that have messaged us saying, my baby is an angel baby. She's been sleeping for six hours. And when we ask more questions, we find out that that baby actually hasn't been very um, vigorous and is quite lethargic. And once we suggest doing some spoon feeding or something like that, all of a sudden the baby perks up and parents are like, oh my gosh, who is this baby? I, did, I don't even recognize it. Um, so it is important to wake your baby, but then things change, the rules change, and nobody necessarily tells you that the rules have changed. And so you're still trying to wake your baby and your baby is just like, like, how do you feed a baby that is just dead to the world? And so we have clients that get so frustrated and they're like, I try everything, but after three hours, the baby's not hungry, like not interested. Baby still wants to sleep. So what's happened is the milk has transitioned from colostrum to breast milk. And now some babies aren't hungry right at that three hour mark. Sometimes they're hungry at two and a half. Sometimes they're hungry at three and a half. And randomly throughout the, the day, as Petra would say, they might have a four hour stretch. It's usually not when we're sleeping as parents, unfortunately, that would be nice, um, but that can happen. And so it, it can be a bit frustrating to, to know when these things have changed, um, but it's good to talk to your pediatrician. And, you know, some of them will say once the baby has reached their birth weight, you can feed on demand. Some will say um, after a certain um, um, time frame or a certain weight. So you just kind of have to, um, to check with them and see. How do you find a pediatrician? That's a, a million dollar question. <laughs> Beg, no, I'm just joking. Um, so you can start um, by asking your family doctor if they have recommendations. Uh, lots of people in parenting groups on Facebook will ask about pa uh, pediatricians in their area. Lots of pediatricians are, um, are not taking patients. So if you have recommendations, then you, um, you may want to ask them if they say that they don't have space available, if they have another um, clinic that they can recommend. And you can just kind of keep going from there. 
if you're close to the hospital, it, like where you're delivering, sometimes you can get um, a pediatrician kind of sneakily. So the pediatrician will come and check your baby before you leave the hospital. So they have to do a head to toe and make sure that the baby is good before they send you home. If you like that pediatrician, you can always say, hey, are you taking patients? Some of them only work through the hospital, but most of them do have practices and they tend to be relatively close to the hospital. So, um, you know, that's something that you could, you could do. And I have witnessed clients get pediatrician appointments this way. So um, you can look at that. How many doulas do you have on your team and what is the average experience? So th this is a great question and it is different for all of us. Um, I have lost track of how many doulas we have on our team. We have some doulas that are birth and postpartum. We have some that are just birth. We have some that are just postpartum and um, I, Jess, do you want to jump in and two, one T? Well, yes. So we've been, <laughs> so Helping Hands has been around for 20 years. And the reason why it isn't easy to answer, it's because the way that we work at Helping Hands is different than a lot of other places that are really just agencies. So you're referred out to another doula on their team, but that's the doula that you're working with. So however much experience that one doula has is what you have um, available to you. The difference with us, and this is why it's hard for me to answer, is that it's not about how much experience I have or how much experience Amanda has or Petra, because we have collective experience. We have team meetings every month. We have meetings with each other every week to talk about client experiences. And I can tell you that like for the first five years as a solo doula, cause I was a solo doula for 15 years, which was not a lot of fun. Uh, this is way better. <laughs> um, but when I was a solo doula, like it takes a long time to learn things because you have to go through that experience yourself to really gain the knowledge. But when we have discussions with each other um, as doula colleagues, we learn so much from each other. And I think even when I had hundreds of births experience, it was really quite limited because it was how I learned to deal with certain experiences. And it wasn't until Jessica and I became partners and we started to share clients and talk more about birth experiences. And then she would say, oh yeah, you know, I had a birth like that. And she would talk about what she did. And I was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> and, you know, technically I had a lot of experience. Um, and the same with postpartum. I think there's, a, there's so many ways of soothing a baby. There's so many tricks that come with changing a baby and, and all of those different things that it's really nice to be able to uh, learn from each other and, and share that knowledge. And also recognize that none of us, no matter how long we have been doing this type of work, have all the answers. I have not been to every kind of birth experience that there is. Um, there are things that I haven't experienced that other doulas have. And so it's really good as a doula to recognize when you don't have the answers and don't try to make things up, <laughs> um, but really be able to um, go to your community and um, of team members and, and get the information. So uh, what is the length frequency of your support during pregnancy and after birth? So I think uh, that this would be a great question um, for, for us to talk about um, a little bit more in depth because all of our packages are a little bit different and it sort of depends on what each family is looking for. So most people will have a half hour um, discussion with myself or Jessica and just learn more about the different packages. But really our birth clients have access to us from the second they hire us. So some as early as 10 weeks <laughs> pregnant and some don't find us until later in their pregnancy. Um, and some of our packages end with the birthday party, as I like to um, describe it. Um, and then some go for six weeks after. So it just kind of depends. Uh, 
So with that, I would love to um, put you in your breakout rooms. Um, and so if you happen to be alone in the breakout room for a minute or two, um, we just ask for your patience. It just means that uh, one of our team members 